connection to the message for this evening, I'd like to open our Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Romans reaches into a lot of doctrinal truths, and of course, here's another one. We died with Christ in our baptism, and we rose again with him. That's the first few verses, and Paul continues to explain kind of what that looks like and what that means for his people, for God's people, in the verses 5 through 11. So let us read those verses. There we find, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. So the question that I'm going to answer this evening under the theme, Pastor, I have a question, is this, what does Christ's resurrection mean for us? Or what does Christ's resurrection mean for me? Now, this question, in some ways, cannot be answered in 20 minutes. You would need uh, an eternity, actually, to answer this question, and you will have that. But it's an important question to answer, because, as it was noted at, at this morning, our Christian faith, in some sense, rises or falls on how we understand the resurrection, what the resurrection means to us. Some of you may know this author, many of you probably don't. His name is John Shelby Spung. He was an Episcopalian bishop from Newark, New York. For many years, he was a teacher and a pastor, a theologian of sorts. But he was a liberal theologian, and he says, we need to kind of reform the the Protestant Reformation, the doctrines of the Protestant Reformation, because he doesn't believe in the veracity of the truth of the resurrection. In fact, he says, I don't know if I believe in the incarnation, the 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 substitutionary atonement of Jesus on the cross or the resurrection. All of those need to be reframed, rewritten, he said. But what's very interesting about, his name is Jack, what's very interesting about Jack is this, that he says, but I'm still, I still have an allegiance to Jesus Christ. I still want to follow Christ, but I don't believe that he rose again. I don't believe in the resurrection. And we would, we would cry foul. You, you can't have Christ without the resurrection. You can't have Jesus as your Lord without him rising from the dead. So the meaning of the resurrection is in the truth that he rose from the dead. We, we begin there. That's foundational for the faith. That's the summit of our Christian faith, you could say. But the question that we have this morning is, what does it mean for believers? What, what are some of the implications, then, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And, and many of them you know. I have ten this evening. That's not ten points. I may get a letter if I say I have ten points. I don't want a letter. Or a comment after church. You have way too many points, Pastor Ian. So I'm going to have ten implications. Just ten. I could have twenty. You could have thirty. Thirty. 30 implications of the reality of the resurrection. But we're going to walk through these. I have about a minute and a half with each implication. And if that overwhelms you, that's the idea. Because the resurrection is ultimately extremely overwhelming. As Pastor Bill shared this morning, it's unbelievable. He even used the I word if you don't, you don't believe it. Some of you remember that. But what does Christ's resurrection mean for us? Number one, that God can be trusted, that God 
can be trusted. God has not deceived us. God has fulfilled the prophecies written of Christ of old that he would rise again. One of those prophecies come to us from, from Psalm 16, verse 11. He would not let his Holy One see decay or corruption. Depends on your translation. He would not let him rot in the grave. Or maybe you think of Isaiah 53, verse 10, where it says the Lord, it was the Lord's will to cause him to suffer. It was the Lord's will for him to become a sin offering. But it doesn't end there. It says the Lord's will was to cause him to suffer and for him to become a sin offering, but he will see his offspring and prolong his days. Well, we are that offspring, and his days are ultimately never ending. They are certainly prolonged because of the resurrection. He can be trusted. He fulfilled that word. Jesus constantly in his ministry said, I, I, I'm, I'm going to die, and, but I'm going to rise again. He used it metaphorically. He said, if you kill this temple, if you destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. Of course, that caused some consternation amongst the people that were listening. But he was speaking about his body. And that's exactly what happened. But here's the text. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. So if it's not true, if God can't be trusted, if Jesus is still in the grave, our faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. But God can be trusted. Our faith is not futile because God can be, God is true to his word and Jesus did indeed rise. Here's the second. This is a bit hard to see. The Lord Jesus is our Messiah. The Lord Jesus is our Messiah, or in Greek, our Christ, or in English, the Anointed One. Now, what did the, what did the Pharisees think? The Pharisees thought many thoughts, but one of the thoughts that the Pharisees had was that Jesus Christ was a messianic pretender. He wasn't the true Messiah. He wasn't the one that they were expecting. He was a pretender. The Jews thought, even those who followed Jesus, even his disciples thought that, yes, Jesus could be the Messiah, but Jesus, as Pastor Bill shared this morning, would, would deliver the people from suffering. And Pastor Bill made the point this morning that actually the Messiah, they had to realize, would deliver his people through suffering. That was something that they didn't understand but that they had to. But the vindication, the kind of the statement that Jesus is truly the Messiah of Israel happened at the resurrection. That Jesus is the vindicated Messiah. He fulfilled God's appointed task for him perfectly and God was pleased to raise him up from the dead. He is the vindicated Messiah who has conquered death and we need to believe in him. It's very interesting. N.T. Wright, one of the authors, uh, has written quite extensively on the resurrection, points out that the first port of call for the apostles upon the resurrection and the downpouring of the Holy Spirit was this, to prove to the people of Israel that Jesus was the Messiah. That was their calling. He was the anointed one. He was the appointed one who was to deliver his people. So when he rose from the dead, vindicated, it was their task now to tell the world that Jesus is the Messiah. And John captures this already in John chapter 20, verse 31, which is at the end of the book. He says this, But these are written, all the things that Jesus has done, so that you may believe that what? Jesus is the Messiah. You see that? You may have other expectations. You may think he's the pretender. You may think other things about him. But he is the anointed one. He is the called out one. He is the appointed one. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. So the resurrection has meaning that we can trust in God. And the resurrection has meaning that we can believe that Jesus truly is the Messiah. Here's the third. The third implication. Because of Christ's resurrection, our justification is secure. And if I was to ask you this question, what would your answer be? Here's the question. You ready? This is a difficult one. 
That's not too difficult. Here it goes. Is our justification, is our justification, that is, being declared right before God, that's our justification. By faith we are declared right before God. That's our justification. Is our justification rooted in Christ's death on the cross or his resurrection? Is our justification rooted in Christ's death or his resurrection? What's the answer? Both. The answer is yes. That's really fun when you can answer yes to two questions. Yes. His death is rooted in the cross, and his death is rooted in the resurrection, and the two shall never be separated. This is what we read in Romans 4. That's why some of you said yes. He was delivered over to death for our sins. So you can say our sins were imputed to him. Our sins were put on Christ. We know that. This is the great exchange. He he got our sins and we get his righteousness. Our sins were imputed, given to Christ. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification, for our righteousness. The only way that we can be clothed in Christ's righteousness is if he rose again. If he was still in the grave today, we would not be clothed in his righteousness. And that's the truth of Christ's justification on our behalf. In verse, Romans 6, verse 8, it says, Now if we die with Christ, we believe that he, we will also live with him. How can we live with Christ? Only if we're justified. How are we justified? Through his death and resurrection. And that's what our catechism points out. Our first, the first answer in the catechism says, um, how does the resurrection benefit us? It says this, First, by his resurrection he has overcome death, so that... Um, He could make us share in the righteousness which he had obtained for us by his death. So that's what we get, knowing that our justification is secure because of the resurrection. Here's the fourth. The fourth is this, that we are made alive in Jesus Christ today. You see, the power and the beauty and the glory of the resurrection is not just a post-mortem reality. It's not just after we die that we are ascending by our spirit into God's presence that we enjoy something of the resurrection reality or when Christ comes back and we are changed in the twinkling of an eye. No, that will happen and that's going to be awesome. But the reality of the resurrection is something we can enjoy as a believer today. You confess Jesus as Lord you can enjoy already today the power, the beauty of the resurrection. And of course, the Holy Spirit was poured out to draw God's people, to draw people to Christ, who the resurrected Christ, so that in Christ they could become a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. The old is the unresurrected, dead person, you could say. And the new person is a new creation, a new resurrected person who follows and loves Jesus. So Peter puts it like this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope. How do we get a new birth into a living hope? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So your new life in Christ, your living hope, is grounded and rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It has meaning for hope, for your hope today. That's the fourth. Here's the fifth. The fifth is this. There is life after life after death. So just add another afterlife in there. Okay, there's life after life after death. I, I made a mistake in not sending that through properly. I stole this also from N.T. Wright, and I'll explain what he means shortly. But Romans 6, verse 8 says this, that if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. What does it mean to live with Christ? Well, today it means that we have spiritual union with Christ. All throughout the New Testament, we are said those who believe in Jesus are in Christ. That's a spiritual union on the reality of the resurrection, the poured out Holy Spirit, that we can be united with Christ. 
It also means this, that were you to die tonight, that you would be going to see, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that you would immediately go as a disembodied spirit, as your spirit, you would go immediately into his kingdom. So he says on the cross to the, to the, to the criminal beside him, you know, today you will be with me in paradise and he wasn't lying. Okay? In my house there's many rooms. I, I'm going to prepare a room for you. That's in this intermediate period. We have this sense that when we die, we will be with Christ. And Paul says it's better by far. I'd rather, do, I'd rather die and be with Christ. It's better by far. But there's something that's important that we realize. This is what N.T. Wright says. He says, the ultimate life after life after death is the resurrection in God's new world. He said, it's more than a more than a story on how we get to heaven. The gospel is more than just a story on how we shoot into heaven. But it's not less than that story. It, it begins at that point where we, after death, get to ascend and be with Christ in heaven. But the story continues. That's an intermediate period. The resurrection is this, that our spirit and our bodies will be joined together again in God's resurrected new world. The resurrection has always been a physical resurrection. That's how the church has always understood it. So this body will be glorified and joined up with my spirit again if I was in heaven, and I will become an embodied or re-embodied person, a glorified person. Paul writes about this in Corinthians. He says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruit. So what Christ is, we become. He is the first fruit. He goes before us. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. So this is a picture of Christ returning and we becoming what he has called us to be or what uh, desires us to be as a resurrected, glorified person. That's the life after life after death. Moving on. Sin no longer has dominion over us. I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on this. I think you understand that the resurrection, the power of Christ, broke the power of sin. Not only did Christ free us from the condemnation of sin, which is beautiful in itself, but he also broke us from the power of sin. Romans 6, verse 6 to 7 says, Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. That's a reality that we have. In Christ, I had to quote one of my sons because he just said it this morning. He said to me, he said, um, or to, to my wife and I, Nadia, and he said, um, after we were telling him about one of his sins, <laughs> um, you know, our children do sin, all of them. He said, well, I've been fighting this sin, but it, it's not, you know, I'm, I'm not winning kind of thing. That's kind of how the conversation went. <laughs> it's like, yeah, when, when am I going to start winning against the sin I have? And then we got all theological on him. But I think the point was, he says, you know, I'm, I'm fighting this sin, but it's not helping. You know, our word to that is, is not, well, okay, you can give up then. You struggle for a long enough time, you just keep sinning. But our word to him and to us all is to keep looking on the one who has conquered that sin for you. Keep looking upon Jesus who broke the back of that sin so that you are no longer a slave to that sin. No, you are now a slave to Christ who defeated that sin. And there's freedom in that. There is no sin that can ultimately overpower you because Christ has overpowered it. But you have to submit to him. That's why Romans 6 verse 11 continues to say, in the same way, count yourself dead to sin. Christ died for your sin, now you count yourself dead to sin. Don't let that sin live any longer, but be alive to God in Christ Jesus. We're no longer a slave to sin, we're a slave to Christ. That's because by the resurrection, Jesus has conquered sin. Here's the seventh. We do not fear death. We do not need to fear death. Because I think many of us do fear death. I'll admit, I, there are times when I am very fearful of death. 
To say that I wasn't would be to lie to you. Sometimes I don't know whether I fear the actual moment of death when your spirit leaves the body or fear the process unto death of what pain or suffering I might have to endure prior to death. But death is a scary reality. It's not uncommon for people to be Christian and yet fear this reality. Because we fear what we do not know. But there's just a few truths that we need to understand when it comes to the resurrection and our death. That we maybe need to preach to ourselves on the day of days. Or the day that we're, not the day of days, but the day that we reach that end. The first is this, that Jesus has conquered death. It has been vanquished. We'd have no reason to have hope and faith at the point of death if Jesus had not conquered it, but we know that he did. Acts 2 verse 24 said, death could not hold him. And if it cannot hold Jesus, and we're united to Jesus, it cannot hold us either. That's Acts 2 verse 24. We know that Jesus is the author of life. We know that Jesus will be with us when we die. Jesus also says, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. In fact, death then is not something to be feared. It's something that will allow us to go to be where he is, to live with him. I remember, what, I remember Polycarp, one of the forefathers of the faith, when he was about to be burned at the stake. There were people who said to him, Polycarp, just, just deny your faith in Jesus Christ and you will live. And he said this, he said, why, why would I deny my faith in Jesus? He has been faithful for all these years to me. You think I would deny him now? And he could have just as well as said, and he will be faithful through the years that will follow and faithful forevermore. I know that since he has been faithful, he will be faithful. And so at the point of death, you can know that the one who saved you from death will be faithful. And so my word to you, to those who fear death, is to remember not to worry about it. <laughs> Just allow Christ to be faithful. Live today for your fullest, and tomorrow belongs to him. Do not fear it. He has conquered it. Number eight, we do not need to fear the devil. He's also been vanquished, conquered, and defeated. Oh, I forgot the, the, the text on there. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? One day you'll be able to make a mockery out of death. That was in seven. Number eight, we do not need to fear the devil. He's been vanquished as well. Satan, of course, knows that our time is short, and Satan does not enjoy, appreciate, love followers of Christ. In fact, he hates us, and we say that contempt all over the world. But his days are numbered, and his strength is waning in many ways. And that's why we read in Romans 16, verse 20, we do not need to fear Satan, because Christ has crushed his head, has broken his back, we're not under him or under his dominion anymore. And God gives us this promise. And this is actually the only time Satan is mentioned in the book of Romans. Under all this beautiful theology, it only comes in the end that Paul makes a short mention of Satan, partly because our theology is not driven by Satan, it's driven by Christ. But here it comes. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will be with you. Just remember... For lo, his doom is sure, Luther said. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen as God designed it. Number nine, we have a message to proclaim. We have a message to proclaim. In Bill's sermon again this morning, he mentioned the fact that the, the two, the couple that were eating with Jesus and had heard the whole story, as soon as Jesus opened their eyes and they realized it was Jesus, the risen Savior in front of them, they may have left their food or packaged it and ran with it, like, you know, food to go, Uber or something, I don't know. And, and they took their food maybe, maybe with them, but the fact is that they got up immediately and walked seven miles or ran seven miles. Why? To tell people about the risen Lord. It's such a burden for them. 
so that other, know, other people know that Jesus is risen. That's the gospel, that people realize that Jesus Christ, the one who came to save us from our sins, is risen again. You know, we live in a, mess, in a world of, of decay, of death, of pain, of sorrow, of grief and shame, and we, and we have the only message of hope in this dark world. The only message. And the message begins here that Jesus died for your sins, but he rose again for your justification. You are free in him. And that's interesting. The apostles went out and with great fervor, they wanted people to know about the resurrection. And it summarizes their ministry. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. I think there's a connection with us boldly testifying, us boldly proclaiming, us boldly sharing the joy, the beauty, the hope, the glory of the resurrection and God's outpouring grace on the people we share it with. You want people to know about Christ, you can't not speak about the resurrection. It's their only hope for this life and the life to come. Finally, here's my last point. We must set our, set our eyes on the resurrected Savior. This is the sine qua non, the, without which there is no hope. The sine qua non of the resurrection is that if you don't believe in the resurrected Lord, there's no hope for a future resurrection to Christ. There's no hope of a resurrection to glory. This is John 6, verse 40, but before I read John 6, verse 40, this is Romans 10, verse 9, also speaking about the resurrection. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So you need to believe that Jesus is Lord. You also need to believe that God raised him from the dead. If you do not believe in that fact, that truth, you will not be saved. That's the negative of this positive statement. If you do not believe, you will not be saved. And this is another statement about the resurrection. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son, the universal statement, everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. Now here's the resurrection. And I will raise them up at the last day when the trumpet shall sound. And the dead in Christ will rise first. They will rise up because their eyes are set upon their Lord and their Savior. I mentioned at the beginning of my message, John Shelby Spung. I mentioned him because one of my best friends had began to start began reading his works, trying to struggle. He was struggling with the resurrection. He fell under the teaching of, of John Shelby Spung. He also then began to deny the resurrection. And it wasn't too, much long, too long after that he became estranged from Jesus. He had no more connection to Jesus Christ. He said it was the loneliest day of his life when he woke up realizing that he no, no longer believed in Christ. But he was hoping that he could kind of hold to the the teachings of Spung, not believing in the resurrection, but still holding to something of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you can't. It's Jesus on the cross for your sins. It's Jesus died and risen again for your justification. It's Jesus in heaven for interceding on your behalf. It's Jesus coming to get you one day or coming back returning to this world and restoring himself to his people and his people restored to him. It's Jesus from start to finish, fully and clearly taught in the words of Scripture. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the gospel of the resurrection. We thank you for all that it means for us. And we thank you, Lord, that because of the resurrection, we have hope for today and hope for tomorrow. 
that there are so many implications in this resurrection story and so much truth and so much beauty in knowing Jesus as the risen Lord. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that doesn't understand or doesn't believe that Jesus is the resurrected Lord, the Savior of their life, that you'll open their eyes and that they'll set their gaze on this beautiful Savior who is no longer in the grave, but is risen on high and will come again to judge the living and the dead. And he will restore us to himself that we will be physically present with our own eyes we will see him on this earth and we will enjoy him for all eternity create a deeper longing in our hearts a stronger faith a deeper love for you in 